Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and by popular demand, I am delighted again to be able to speak to George Ensor of River and Mercantile, one of the UK's finest small and mid-cap investors. So welcome, George. Thank you, Paul. That's a very, very generous welcome. Well, um, a lot's been happening since uh, we last spoke, certainly, uh, you know, sort of like over the last uh, 12, nine months, etc. Not least, we've now got... Um, record or multi-decade inflation levels, um, tightening central banks, um, higher bond yields, throw in some um, Ukraine-Russian crisis to boot. And now, as of yesterday, we've had supply chains being exacerbated by further lockdowns out in uh, in China as well. So, so put all of that together, what's your sort of outlook for equities? Yeah, it feels, feels a bit like we've kind of leapt from, um, from crisis to crisis, doesn't it? Um, no, it, it, it's it's challenging outlook at the moment, isn't it? There's lots of things to worry about, but historically that's often been quite a good time to put capital to work. So that would be one thing to say. Um, our benchmark um, is the new Miss Smaller Companies Index. Um, that's trading at around 12 times one year forward PE if you if you strip out the loss makers. So you know that's um, that's pretty attractive. Um, certainly derated quite a bit since since the middle of last year. The earnings expectations in, in that benchmark for this year are about 10%. They started the year at 20%. So again, that's a pretty reasonable um, setup, all else being equal. Um, now, earnings revisions have been coming down, hence the move from 20 to 10. And, and markets tend to derate when you've got negative earnings revisions. So that is still in play. We've got headwinds coming through. You've got wage inflation coming through. You've got raw material price inflation coming through. So that is the direction of travel at the moment. Um, but overall, the valuation setup setup is quite interesting. I think in small caps particularly, there's there's been a big, big drawdown. So I don't have the exact data because I haven't gone into it scientifically, but I've looked at kind of some of the, the big small cap drawdowns. So I've been looking at the numerous smaller companies index which is the bottom 10% of listed companies in the UK versus the wider um, UK, the, the all share essentially. Um, we've underperformed, the small cap benchmark has underperformed by 20% since the middle of September. That's a, that's a pretty meaningful drawdown. Um, if you go back to the prior period when I've been running money, where we've had a, a similar drawdown, that was um, 2018, 2019, started kind of late 2018 as the Fed started to tighten. Um, and um, ran through most of 2019, especially for micro caps. It, it kind of, um, um, it, you know, the inflection point was that was the general election in late 2019. The max drawdown then was 16 and a half percent. So we're we've gone beyond that. Um, I wasn't running money back in in the global financial crisis, but that's the the next um, significant period of small cap underperformance. Um, that was 25 percent. So about J July. Um, 2007 to December 2008 was about 20% drawdown in smaller companies. So look, you, you can't take any um, conclusions from the extent of the drawdown other than it's been pretty severe. Um, hopefully, probably we're, we're closer to the to the bottom of that than, than the top of that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're raising that excellent point because if the, um, you know, if it's trading the small cap indexes on a sort of like a P of, a, of sort of 12 going forward, and the you know sort of expectations for earnings of twelve that puts you on a peg of one, which actually historically is pretty low across the whole patch, and that includes sort of like you know growth stocks, GARP stocks, and you know sort of value as well. And I did see I was saying on your portfolio, you've got a lovely sort of mix here of sort of like uh, you know some deep value, some good sort of like GARP stocks and recovery stocks. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm with you. It comes, it's the thing that's going to come down to sort of good stock selection and stock picking um, going forward. Now, uh, just, to, just moving on to that one perfectly, sort of like, um, I see you've got some new positions and one of them is actually a bit of a, well, it's a GARP stock. It's uh, One Spatial, which I think is run by um, Claire Milverton. And um, it does location master data sort of management software, cleansing, et cetera. And I'm guessing this is sort of driven by the global trend to sort of digital twins, to digitization, to asset, more efficient asset management. Do you want to, do you want to take us through this? Because it seems uh, sure. it's trading on about 1.5 times sales. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. So um, One Spatial is a software business, as, you, as, as you've said. Um, we, have, we own it as a, as a growth stock, um, but it's quite an early stage software business. Um, so what they do, as you've said, again, is provide data management services to their clients. Their area of speciality is geospatial data, so location data. Um, so their software um, ensures that their clients are using um, up-to-date data, um, compliance data, um, complete data. So the best data that you can, you can get to inform uh, your insights, which informs your decisions, so hopefully better decision-making, but also typically your, your, that software is coming in and replacing what is quite you know, labor intensive manual intervention of those numbers, either checking the numbers or pulling the, pulling the data all together. So it's quite a high ROI um, solution um, to those customers. Um, you've touched on the, on the rating. What we think is quite interesting is actually they've got a good track record of delivering recurring revenue growth. The business is transitioning from a license, perpetual license business model to a SaaS business model. We typically see a slowdown in headline revenue growth when that happens, because you're deferring revenue to, to periods mm. outside of the, the current accounting period. Um, but they've continued to deliver attractive revenue growth in, in the recurring revenues. Um, and as you say, one and a half times sales, they've actually got about nine or 10% revenue growth forecast for the current year. Um, we think that's largely underpinned by the um, contract wins they've, they've historically announced um, and one and a half times EV sales, so 28 million revenue forecast for this year, you've got a 40 million EV. Um, the business is probably also under earning versus typical software margins, it's got mid-teens EBITDA margin, um, but that EV sales multiple is probably bottom, bottom quartile of, of listed software businesses, I'd have thought. Yeah, I mean, normally you'd have expected a large cap sort of software business will be well over five times, five to 10 times, and a small cap will be three to five times sales. So yeah, I'm with you. I mean, it looks, uh, certainly looks a very deep value uh, GARP stock with uh, recurring revenue streams and, and good long term sort of contracts. I think it sells into sort of transportation companies, governments, utilities and stuff like that, doesn't it? And yeah. another, another one, industrial company, Renault. Now, this is a really sort of like um, old-fashioned chain-making business that uh, seems to be doing really well. It was a new position. Do you want to take us through that one? Yeah, so Renault's been a, a listed business for a long time. They make um, industrial chains, highly engineered industrial chains. So where you might see a Renault chain would be in a... Um, uh, a warehouse, an automated warehouse, um, but lots of wider industrial uh, uses as well. Um, the business has gone through a period of, of restructuring and through a period of capex investment. So we think it's under earning. The management team have said that that it is under earning, and they're looking to improve the margins. So we own it as a recovery um, investment case. Mm. So you've got that very attractive combination of depressed profitability to making kind of seven to eight percent margins. Um, they they can go up quite meaningfully yeah, that's right um it's also trading on seven six or seven times pe um now <laughs> yeah. that's slightly flattered by uh, a pension deficit so mm -hmm. um it isn't quite that cheap if you take the pension deficit into the enterprise value but just, nevertheless just, you've got just that. on that just on george just on that pre pension deficit is that is that neutralized or at a lower effectively at a lower level with with interest rates or is that actually is that going to reduce significantly as bond yield, corporate bond yields rise well they've they've got a funding deficit but at the moment the accounting deficit is made to look more extreme than it would be in a in a normal environment um, mm. so you've got you've got to think about both sides of that we just take a, a dcf of the future cash commitments um, yeah. to that pension deficit and think about what that is on a on a, on a sensible discount rate. But you've got that combination of um, a cheap starting multiple and depressed profitability. Um, so if we're right and the margins do improve, they're gonna compound pretty high profit growth. Um, and that should hopefully deliver a, a re-rating. I'm not saying it's gonna to move to be a highly rated business, but it, it should re-rate. And then actually the final um, kind of leg to the investment case um, is acquisitions. They made it very clear in their trading statement of last week or the week before that they want to look to consolidate um, what is quite a highly fragmented industry. We've spoken to the management team about that. They think they can do that quite cheaply. There aren't any other consolidators out there. Um, so you're essentially quite cheaply buying revenue and driving that operational leverage through, through your um, manufacturing footprint. 
Yeah, and they, they must. I mean, they seem to have some strong USPs because they seem to be able to push in their prices up, don't they, to be able to recover all the raw material and the uh, the energy um, cost yeah, so, inflation. So the reason why they've got pricing power is the chain is going to be quite a small cost to the overall solution. So take a um, automated warehouse. You'll have chains in that warehouse, but the chain's going to be quite a small element of cost. But if the chain breaks, the warehouse isn't going to function. Um, and so people want high quality chains that aren't going to break and aren't going to have lots of downtime. Um, so it's a small element of the overall cost, um, but a critical element um, to the to the solution. Yeah, they use those chains for the conveyor belts, don't they? For sort of which is yeah. say for online warehouses and also for mining and stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. A, a recent um, IPO is um, just moving on is is strip tinning, which is actually ne- it, it's based, I think, in in the heart of the West Midlands, which is just yeah, next, is, just yeah. next just next to me and stuff. It's got a yeah. sort of like heritage over sort of like you know its family and stuff, and it and it. I think it did sort of like glazing, heating windows and stuff like that, as in like a car automotive uh, windows to be able to demist them and this sort of yeah. stuff. But it seems to have some quite niche technology for EV, which seem which right. seems to be is that what's attracted to you, or, or well, how do you uh, see the business? So, so, so a combination of the track record of the business and, and that opportunity. So IPOs have been few and far between this year, but that was one we participated in. Mm. Um, as you say, family-owned business prior to the IPO, family run for 65 years. Richard um, Barton, isn't it, or something? That's right, yeah. His so, brother Dick. Um, um, have, a high, um, have a high market share in, in the components that connect electricity to your windscreen, also your mm. sunscreen and your, and your rear windscreen. So um, the heritage of business is those um, wires that run through your front windscreen that you yeah. switch on the demister. Um, yeah. And they have high market share in, in those um, auto electrical glazing connectors, which is that component. Um, why it's quite exciting, so that you've got a track record of a business that's, that's delivered kind of margins in excess of 20%, and then you've got two interesting growth drivers. One is that new cars are coming with much more functionality in the windscreen or the sunscreen. So um, OEMs are now putting the antenna into the windscreen. You've got heads-up displays in the windscreens. Oh, of course. Some of the luxury cars are now coming yeah. with um, automatic tinting. So when the sun's on the left-hand side, they'll tint top left-hand side of the windscreen to, to block out the sun. So that increased functionality requires the IP that strip tinning have. And so they will have more content going into to newer cars. And then the other um, potential growth driver, which is why they've IPO'd, is the use of um, flexible printed circuit boards in electric vehicles. So in the battery, connecting the individual cells in the battery of an EV. Um, and the two reasons why it is beneficial versus the existing is they're very light and weight in electric vehicles is very important, but it's all, they're also very easy to use in the assembly process for the, for the OEMs. Um, and they have had that product validated by a luxury German OEM that has signed a contract and they have um, you know, a very large potential sales pipeline to go after. And the IPO proceeds um, were raised to kind of build out their first mover advantage in that opportunity. But it was IPO'd on what is now trading on sub 10 times PE. So yeah. I don't think there's an awful lot in the price for either of those growth opportunities, um, given it's a, a 20% EBITDA margin business. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, uh, you know, I think in EVs, if, if nothing else, has been accelerated, that whole trend. I mean, it was already going gangbuster, but it's been accelerated even faster by the Ukraine, sort of Russia sort of crisis, et cetera, all things electrical. And if you've got a a car or bus or anything like that that requires electrics. They need wires, don't you? And uh, strip tinning seems to be in a good place to uh, to be yeah. able to supply that. Now, a couple of fallen angels. Uh, well, in fact, everything is really small cap has fallen, doesn't it? So because we yeah. know that from the portfolios. But um, one in particular, Kate Box, now run by a sort of a CEO, Sukh Chamdal, a founder, and um, I think they've had a sort of like a couple of minor sort of reporting sort of. Um, Things with their with, between their last year between their prelims and um, their audited accounts. Anyway, it's it's led to a sort of drop in the shares, and it's almost in fact I think they're halved, um, even though they've had really strong growth. And um, what's your sort of view of the of the sort of the, this egg free sort of like um, 100 franchise celebration cake um, distributor in the UK? So we we think the business model's a great business model. We've owned it for a while. Um, 
you know, you've got very little capex requirement. You've got high margin. They've delivered revenue growth on the back of not only like for likes, but but new stores coming. And I think they've just come out saying they've got a record number of deposits um, for for new stores to roll out going forwards. Mm. So the, the fundamentals of the business we think are very attractive. Um, there was, you know, as you've referred to, a blog um, that spoke about the quality of the reporting um, in the accounts. Um, we, we were aware of some of the issues that have been raised, particularly the change of auditor and also the IT breach, um, which they have been very slow to report. Um, my take on it is that you've got a family run business um, that is now listed, but has grown very, very quickly. Um, and the company have already acknowledged that they haven't invested in um, governance and the audit function as they should have, mm. as that business um, has grown and the growth has been delivered. So. Um, they'd already said they were going to invest um, in that um, and, and drive improvement. So, you know, this is a speed bump for a small growth business. The, what's happened is you've got an illiquid share that's done very well um, and everyone heads for the door at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then the, the more the share price falls, the more people think something's wrong. And so more people head for the door. Um, it was probably compounded by the general aversion to, to UK small caps. Plus, it's a UK consumer discretionary stock and consumer discretionary stocks are, are also very out of favour. So, you know, move from everything kind of being for it to everything being against it. You've now got a business on 13 times, um, which is very capable of compounding high, high growth and returns um, for certainly the next few years. Yeah, I think the online side is doing very well also, isn't it? It's sort of like uh, almost, a, they were saying, uh, when I interviewed them, I think they were saying there's an almost a third now, which is produced, which is basically sold online or or effectively click and collect out the outside the you know, the franchise stores. So uh, they're really moving into sort of e-commerce e as well. Yeah. Now, an another one, another fallen angel, Venture Life, which is a, uh, basically does... Um, it does sort of like uh, consumer healthcare products, niche consumer like mouthwash and uh, other mm -hmm. sort of like uh, uh, products that w was trading at, a, I think when we first spoke, it was trading about a pound and now it's trading at sub 40p. Mm -hmm. um, but frankly, see, I mean, they also had a few speed bumps this last year, et cetera, but put out some pretty good sort of like uh, second half numbers. Um, but it seems to be trading at about half the valuation of other sort of like consumer healthcare stocks? Yeah, so strategy is um, buy and build of, of self, self care brands. Mm. Um, so they look to, or well, they've got a track record of acquiring quite cheaply. Um, they then try and drive the organic sales opportunity by distributing through their existing um, infrastructure sales networks. Uh, and then they in house the, the manufacturing to drive margin improvement. Um, so that's a, a great strategy. Um, they did a placing in late 2020 at 90p. That's right. Uh, um, where they raised money to, for, to fund the next handful of acquisitions. They then delivered a pretty soft first half from a revenue perspective mm. um, and then downgraded expectations twice in the second half. They had um, disappointing performance from their Chinese distribution partner. They had some supply chain challenges, um, impacted costs. They, they never made up for that revenue softness from, from the first half. So the market doesn't like companies that raise money and then, <laughs> then downgrade expectations twice. Um, the shares went from 90p that they did the placing at to, I think, 30p, and they've, they've bounced a little from, from that level. But as you say, the, I think the, the average historic multiple for the business is about 10 times EV EBITDA. Yeah. They're trading at, at five times now. The expectation set has been reduced. Um, however, they need to deliver to that lower expectation set to, to start to rebuild the rating on the business. Um, you know, Alliance Farmer is a larger, more mature business, but it, it does have the same strategy and they're trading on 13 times EV EBITDA. So there is a clear valuation opportunity, um, but sentiment is very negative to this stock because they've downgraded several times uh, and they, they need to execute to, to those numbers. Yeah. And also you've got, uh, there's actually a lot of M&A going off in this area because uh, Unilever, what about two or three months ago, offered 50 billion pounds for GSK's consumer healthcare division, which isn't actually um, growing as fast as, um, as Venture Life's one, but they offered sort of like, I think that was 20 times EBITDA actually when you ran, ran the numbers. So, but 
anyway, yeah. I mean, it's a different opposite, scale. opposite end of the market. Yeah, exactly. It's a different scale, but even so, it does it shows you the significant upside um, to that. Uh, another one which is um, a, a class in the sort of fallen angel is Supreme, which is I think it's the one of the UK's biggest uh, vaping product um, distributors yeah. and, um, and and manufacturers and. Uh, I think its vaping business is doing very well. It's still growing at sort of ten percent. In fact, the whole of its all of its organisation is still growing. It just had a in one of its smaller product lines, its sports lines. It had an increase in inflation, didn't it, which left to, to shares to bomb. So, so, if you want to take us through that one, because it just seems again very harshly treated. Yeah, um, I mean, you've you've you, you've almost done it for me. I think you've described Sorry. it very well. So, um, no, no, that's fine. Um, they um, so they have they have their own brands and they have licensed brands. Um, so they um, manufacture and distribute um, mm. value products. So eighty eight vape is their vaping products. That's the leading vaping product in the UK by by volume, about thirty percent market share. Mm. Um, they charge um, for the refills you get for a for a vape. You, they charge a pound. Um, competitors charge between three and five pounds. A lot of them sit at four pounds. So it's a value product, um, but actually Supreme make a very high gross margin on the manufacturing of that, make a 40 to 45% gross margin. That division's just grown at 10%. They're guiding to double digit growth going forwards. Um, so that's a very attractive business. Again, we spoke about cake box, very low capital requirements, um, attractive margins, high return on capital. They, these, both of these stocks fit into our quality category of stock, um, albeit they both are also delivering attractive levels of growth. Um, the challenges they've had have been one in their sports nutrition business, which is very small, it's about 10% of, of the business, um, where they've seen way inflation impact the profitability, the gross margin of that division. We've seen that in other um, sports nutrition businesses. Um, that has been a dynamic of, of last year. Uh, and then they've also flagged higher distribution costs impacting um, impacting costs there, and, and they referenced um, uh, fuel costs there. So um, the business is derated. It's still sitting a bit above its IPO price, um, but is trading on, I think, 12 times 9% free cash flow yield. So again, you know, we spoke about right at the start where the market's sitting um, uh, in terms of valuation. That, you know, we think that is an attractive valuation to get into a high return um, business that can compound attractive levels of growth. Mm. Yeah, and I think the other similarity with you mentioned with Kate Box is the CEOs, founder CEOs, and uh, the one yeah. is, is it Sandy Chamdal, who I've not spoken yeah. to, but I hear very highly. Likewise with with Suk of uh, you know basically the actual business, they still lo love it. They're very passionate and they're entrepreneurial and that sort of like uh, part of the. Uh, and, black and, and they they own a substantial amount of the shares as well. The same with Cakebox. Um, it's the same with Strip Tinning. The CEO owned ninety five percent prior to IPO. He now owns fifty five or fifty six percent of the company. Um, so we've got management teams or at least CEOs that are that are very well aligned. Yeah, yeah, they're well, they're well committed, aren't they? It's plenty yeah. of skin in the game there. Um, now, one which is, gives you a bit of sort of like um, again a, another fallen angel. Um, it sort of gives you a bit of portfolio um, resilience and um, counter cyclicality. Is Mano Lay that came out with a uh, well, it wasn't a trading update. We came out with a trading update last week, which was which was positive, saying it was see it's basically the UK's number one insolvency litigation uh, funder run by CEO Stephen Cooklin. But uh, it's basically um, starting to see an increase in insolvencies coming through the yeah. in, insolvency practitioners. Do you want to? Because this this again, I think when we chatted to you, we well, chatted last year. They were on about sort of four pounds, and now they're even today after a nice little bounce, they're still only sort of two sixty. Uh, yeah. So um, they 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 aren't funders. They actually they actually own the cases. So they yeah, sorry, buy they, yeah, yeah. They, they they buy the insolvency cases from the insolvency yeah. practitioners. Um, they then take their expenses, so any rewards, they take their expenses back from first and then they share the, um, the balance with other creditors, um, which is typically HMRC. Mm. Um, so what's important is working out whether or not the defendant is going to be able to honour the payment. So if they have mm. the, the assets essentially to, to fund the, the reward. 
Um, and Mandalay have got a very good long-term track record of identifying the cases they should buy. Um, they take very little legal risk. The risk, as I said, is, is in that in the repayment piece. I think the long-term track record is kind of 170% return on investment, 130% mm. IRR. Um, however, what they've gone through over the last two years is a, a huge amount of government intervention into the insolvency market. Essentially, insolvencies were, were, were put on pause for, for a year or so. That started to come off back end of last year and, and the end of March, uh, end of last month was, was the end of, of any of that government intervention. We've actually just had the, the, the data from the insolvency service, which is a, um, um, a government um, mm. office um, for the March data and the insolvency data in the UK for March is actually very, very high compared to the, the mm. prior two years. So these cases are now coming through. Um, it will take a while for those cases to feed through the system and be purchased by, by Manalay. Um, one of the frustrations the markets have with Manalay is the way they account. So they use fair value accounting. So they mark up the value of that case when they acquire it. Um, that worked against them when the cases slowed down because their mm. P&L um, is very geared to new cases. Um, we, should see that we should see that working in the opposite way when, when the... Um, new cases spike back up as we we expect in the next six or nine months mm. but the cash has flooded through hasn't it i mean they made a lot of collections in the second half and i think they've just yes yeah, so the revenue leads leads the cash because of that that fair value accounting they have unrealized fair value gains in their in their revenue line yeah they said this morning that uh, they just received a big chunk from a uh, a large case that has settled i think was nine and a half million and uh, it means that um I think their debt now is net net down to well, it's 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 six point five, which running the numbers from Pill Hunt look as about point eight um, of net you know net EBITDA net debt. So you know it's uh, it's no here or there to a certain extent. Now just moving on to sort of like disruptive financials and tech, um, Aquis Exchange. I mean, Aquis Exchange. I mean, you and I, obviously, one of the banes of being in the small cap and micro cap sector is liquidity. And these guys sort of like, um, that's their bread and butter, I think, is sort of like doing uh, liquidity for, for smaller companies. Yeah, so they, they own what used to be called the NEX exchange. Yeah, uh, that's right. It, it's actually a very small part of the business. So the, the Aquis um, main business is, is operating a pan-European um, exchange. Um, they have um, engineered that in a way so that they can exclude um, high frequency traders or at least um, non passive aggressive high frequency traders. So um, best ex when people talk about best execution, there's kind of a, a list of things that you need to look at. One of those is around toxicity, which is the change in the price between submitting an order and that order being executed. Mm. Um, Aquis Exchange has the lowest toxicity of, of any of the pan-European exchanges because they exclude these high-frequency traders. So a combination between that and their subscription model, which means the marginal cost of a trade is, is often zero, um, means that they should take share on the back of best execution. And they've gone up to about 5% market share uh, in Europe. Um, we would expect that share to continue to develop over the over, um, the coming years and that that's the big driver of the business to be honest the second most important part of the business is them using that technology that they've built for their own exchange and licensing it to other companies um, outside of equities um, and so you know it's a, it's a technology business um, we spoke earlier about ev sales for for small cap tech businesses this is one that trades on five times sales so that's probably the upper end of the, of mm. the tip rating for small caps um, but versus the the exchanges, um, they I think the peer group trades on about seven and a half times sales. Mm. The drop through margin that um, Aquis has been delivering um, last year, twenty twenty one, was fifty percent. So it is a highly profitable business, um, supporting that um, that higher EV sales multiple. And how do they get sort of traction in the larger end of the um, the market then? As in, like if, if they're doing sort of you know, sort of like, um, you know, they want to move and get their market share where there's greater liquidity and um, greater depth, then how do they get into sort of like FTSE 250, 350, or even FTSE 100 companies? So, so they just demonstrate to the investment banks and the other participants in the market that by coming to Aquis, you're going to get, you're going to fulfill your best execution requirements. And so that is how I think they IPO'd 
I guess, three or four years ago now. Um, they IPO'd, I think they had 2% market share. They've been building up that market share over the last um, three or four years, and they've got to 5%. Interestingly, they've got a much higher market share of best bid or offer. So from a liquidity perspective, they should be operating at a higher market share. Um, but it takes time for, for you know, institutions to change the way they execute their, their, um, their flow. So that's the like you, we're talking about Goldman Sachs, Citibank, Barclays, yeah, exactly, people yeah. like that deciding to move their the volume rather than from their dark pools or from the LSE onto um, to Aquas Exchange. Yeah, I mean none of them exclusively use one exchange. They have um, uh, they have models that choose when and where to to put trade. So they they will they will choose at different times to use different exchanges depending on what what is bid or offered on that exchange at that time. Okay. Now, again, moving on to um, uh, Argentex, which is a sort of like a foreign exchange sort of fintech uh, disruptor of, uh, of banks, I think, um, a replace, is sort of like a replacement service, etc. It seems to be growing very well. And it's, in a, again, in a really sort of like um, high growth market, which is, you know, e-payments and all things international payments, etc. Um, it seems to be trading on a ridiculously low value. It's stuffed full of cash. Um, and, um, you know, it's run by, I think it's, is it Harry Adams or something from, 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 do you want to take, why is, why, why is it so lowly rated? It seems crazy. Yeah. So, um, they provide FX services, um, to, to corporates and individuals. Mm. So yeah. people need to do, um, large hedges or large spot transactions. Um, you would typically go to your bank. The, the service levels out of the banks um, have been poor for many years. And so there's and expensive <laughs> and expensive. And so there's this disintermediation mm. market share being taken by these um, these fintech businesses. Um, and that is what Argentex has been doing. And I think five years they've delivered 25 percent revenue growth, mm. um, which is a, a very impressive track record. They have had some challenges around the margin. So they've had to invest in in um, in the corporate and into governance. Um, so margins come down a bit, as we see in lots of businesses that, that list, but it's still they still deliver 30 percent operating margin or, or, or just yeah. about, I think. Um, so highly profitable. And, you know, the, what, what's happened is the business is derated. So the, the it's, range it's, on eight, of, it's on eight, just over eight times PR yeah. with, with a shed load of cash as well. I think if you look at the history since IPO, the peak multi the peak multiple is twenty two times, and the trough was six times. And we're sitting at eight times, and 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 this is indicative of what happens. Companies miss expectations, as these guys have. Um, they have had um, ambitious forecasts in the market that they have not delivered to, um, and um, the the business is just derate and derate and derate um, until they get into this kind of position. You're right, it's eight times earnings with I think a quarter of the market cash is in is in PLC cash. Now they do need that cash to execute their operations because mm. they need it for collateral, but nevertheless, they've got a, a big net cash balance there as well. Yeah, it seems like a, if the market doesn't recognize the value, somebody will take it off. <laughs> seems, seems too cheap. Um, now, Lend Invest, which I haven't sort of ever really looked at. I think it um, it IPO'd, um, I can't remember, was it last year, was it? 186. Yeah, last year, yeah. And it's, yeah. it's trading slightly above that at the moment, but it does sort of like it's alternative finance disruptor of sort of like uh, bridging loans and uh, buy to let loans, et cetera, for, I think it's for professional investors actually. But um, can you just take us through that one in terms of specifically one of its USPs? Is Sure. So um, we were just talking about a, a fintech business. This is a prop tech business. So they yeah. have a, a platform essentially where they are matching institutional capital. So the institutional capital might come from a, a city or a JP Morgan with UK securitized lending. Um, and so when you think of a typical bank, take a challenger bank, they will use retail deposits and they'll need their own internal capital to support that. Um, to support the lending that they're making, and they'll make the, the the spread between their cost of finance and the and the and the mortgage rate. Um, Lend Invest works more like a platform, so they're taking a, a an ongoing commission 
on mortgages they place with with these pools of capital and so they've got a more diversified financing structure than your typical mortgage provider um, and then they're trying to compete with the other mortgage providers in terms of user experience and integrating technology to to make that process quicker and more efficient um, so what's interesting is the capital requirements versus a, a, a normal bank normal mortgage lender are much lower they only need their own capital when they go into a um, a new market so the, the, the new vertical they've launched is specialist homeowner mortgages and they have to co-invest with their partners to kind of seed the market and prove that they can underwrite in that in that um, subsector and then as they build up a track record um, it ends up just being totally third party funded and, and they sit there as the platform in the middle so they delivered I think 60% EBITDA growth last year about the same forecast for this year. They're trading on 14 times PE, which um, is, is a pretty attractive multiple for a high yeah. growth um, business like that. The IPO, as you say, last year, they said that they wanted to, um, their ambitions for, for the EBITDA was, was three to five X over, over the medium term, which we've taken to be kind of four to six years. Right. So effectively, what you're saying is that once they actually re re have a mature position, say, like in the UK, buy to let, etc., they don't act as principal. They don't use their own balance sheet at all. They use somebody right. else's and then just take a clip in terms of marrying up the buyer and the seller of that of that particular. Yeah, it, it varies because, they, as you say, they've got some bridging loans in there as well. And I think they use some of their capital for the bridging loans. But if we take the buy to let, which is probably their largest opportunity, they just they're placing those mortgages with some of those financial institutions that are looking for a yield pickup. Right. So effectively, then, if they do see, I mean, I'm, there's no sign of it at the moment, but if there was a slowdown in the UK market with credit quality and it was hitting with with mortgage rates increasing for um, for homeowners and they were starting to see a, uh, you know, houses going into, or homeowners going into default, it wouldn't actually impact them at all other than just being able to take the clip, I guess. Um, so the rate of loan originations is important for them delivering their growth ambitions. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and as I've said, when they've, when they've built these, um, when they've built their track records, they have put their own capital in. So if you, if you rewind, you know, a number of years, they have got some of their own capital at risk. So yeah, okay. it, it, there would be some impact. Yeah, okay. But it's not as bad as a bank, not as bad as Lloyd's, for instance. <laughs> no, and, and I, you know, to the point on that, I would say that UK um, households are are um, in a pretty rich place at the moment. No, they so are, yeah. Leverage, I mean, is, they, leverage is yeah. low and savings are very high. So we feel quite quite good about that side of it. Yeah, loan to values are still very low. I mean, I think um, that's sort of like about 40, 45% overall or something uh, extremely uh, easy, should be should be relatively easy. Now, um, again, sort of like moving down onto sort of like GARP secular growers, science in sport, which I think does sort of like, uh, or sort of came out of the, doing the sports gels for uh, for Team Sky, but now it's sort of like the Team Grenade, uh, Ineos Grenadiers, I think they're, 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 they call themselves. And I didn't realize, but um, this is a really sort of high value premium product, isn't it? Sort of high gross margins. Do you want to take us through that, this one? Yeah, so they've got two brands, but the one you've touched on there is their, their science and sport brand. Um, so that's for, well, it's used by elite athletes, but it's everything down to your kind of, you know, Weekend so people warriors. like you then, George. Weekend warriors, they put it, someone who goes out and, and goes for a long run or, or yeah. does a triathlon. Um, but, you know, there are lots of instances. They, they clearly lead on products because the top athletes use them. Um, yeah. I think all or 19 of the of the Premier League football teams use their gels. You see people running on with the science and sport gels. We saw Rafa Nadal using a science and sport gel in his Australian Open final in Melbourne. So it, it clearly, and these guys are paying for the product. They're not giving mm. the product for free. And you wouldn't see people like that taking a product they didn't believe was going was gonna to help their performance. So it's, it's science-led, product innovation-led, but it, it's a growth business. They've got a, a long, I think, seven-year track record of, of organic growth in excess of 25%. 50% gross margin. They've just um, started another investment cycle, capex cycle, um, which they are, which they think will move their gross margin from 50 up towards 55. Mm. Um, they're profitable only just, but they've done two years of profit, um, and it's business that trades on one times EV sales. It's got there's another brand as well, which is which is PhD, which is a, mm. a more of a protein and, and lifestyle brand. But they've got two very good brands in there. Um, and one-time sales is is a you know 
a, a very attractive entry point from a valuation perspective. Oh yeah, no, I, I would agree for a sort of premium product. And I, I did see actually that the the, uh, the online sales are now more than half the business, isn't it? Sort of. Uh... Yeah, so that's been one of the dynamics of of, of the pandemic is their online sales have grown um, to over fifty percent. That supported the gross margin. Um, I think second half of last year they did four new record um, online sales months. And actually, March, they came out and said that March was a new group revenue record month. So we expect that for growth businesses. They're expected to grow month on month and year on year. That's that's what we expect. But yeah, this is a business that's, that is delivering exceptionally well. Yeah. Have you tried the product at all? Is it, is... I, have, I have. I'm guilty of, um, of trying the product, yeah. And what's it? Is it good? Is it? Well, do you make, you were didn't make, didn't make any that. difference to, to, to my, uh, my output, no, not really. <laughs> Um, now, what active ops, which I think is a sort of like a, um, a software process automation, sort of, you know, improves efficiencies of back office in sort of financial uh, companies. And uh, again, it sort of IPO'd last year. Um, I was just looking at the actual price. I can't remember what it was, but it was, that's right, £1.68. And the shares are trading at was just south of 90p at the moment, but it seems to be growing meeting all its financial targets and but the shares have almost halved yeah i think i think it's a really good example of the of the sentiment towards micro caps at the moment mm. um, it's it's very very poor yeah. so active ops um uh, provide a um, software solution to corporates that have um, large back offices that tend to be spread across multiple locations even multiple geographies so they deliver productivity improvement to those back office operations um, interestingly, the, the, what causes productivity to be, to be low is that people don't have enough work to do. So mm. these offices are staffed for peak volumes mm. um, and, and then people don't have enough, enough to do. So the productivity is, is very volatile. Um, and what active ops do is they um, enable companies to use their capacity much more efficiently by sharing work between the various back office operations um, appropriately. So they pitch a 15% improvement in productivity, which is 100% ROI. Um, and then, as you say, the business IPO'd um, last year, they IPO'd on five and a half times EV sales. So going back to that range, we're using the top end, I guess, of the, of the small cap range. Um, uh, I think they got up to about six, six and a half times post IPO. And then they've, despite delivering one revenue upgrade, um, and I think two cash beats um, since then, the ratings come back to to sub three times. Yeah, it's it's, it's this year's it's two point three times from my calculation. So <laughs> it's a real deep value um, stuff. And I did see that its pipeline, apparently in its last quote in its trading update, was sixty percent higher than it was in well, twelve months ago in February uh, twenty twenty one. So uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean one, one of the things that has I guess. Um, been flagged was an extending sales process in the US. Mm. So um, with people still working from home, it's harder to complete deals. And so that cycle has extended. Yeah. Um, US is an important region for them, but they've got a they've got a big hopper. I think probably the pandemic impacted how quickly that hopper has been built. So mm. whilst it's outperformed the, the, the sell side IPO expectations, I expect um, it probably hasn't met where the buy side were expecting the business to deliver to. And that is why the business is derated. Yeah, OK. Uh, but I guess going forward, you know, it supplies into, uh, I think it's mainly the your sort of in the financial institutions. So the banks and the insurers and people like that nationwide and TD Bank and people yeah. like that. And I'm guessing if they operate a hybrid system going forward to allow staffs flexible working, then this type of software, actually the pandemic is going to, only accelerate it because it's going to allow you to sort of like get more efficiency from people who are working on a more remote basis. Yeah, I think it's important in these to often try and step back a bit and say, how has the pandemic or how has whatever event impacted the medium term opportunity for mm. um, revenue growth returns margins? And I think it's, it's probably been positive. The short term impact has probably been that it's it's slow new re new contract wins, but the medium term mm. opportunity is probably at least as good as it was before. Yeah, yeah. And again, another one which has been, which is IPO'd last year, moving into sort of like a different sector, but uh, it's an online um, 
distributor of all things building products in the UK, which is CMO Group. And uh, I think it's run by, again, one of the founders, Dean Murray. Um, and um, it IPO'd at 165 last year and is now at 136. And again, he's sort of trading on roughly around about one time sales, which for sort of like a, you know, a disruptor in this area seems to be pretty cheap. Yeah, um, so I think it's I think it's around the IPO price, um, but I might be wrong. It's one of the few D 2 C businesses that listed last year that that is either up or or still quite mm. close to their IPO price. So um, they have a um, building merchants um, online business. Um, that industry, about ten percent of it, is served online. Mm. Um, of that ten percent, only four percent of that sits with pure play online businesses. And CMO is the, is the market leader in there with about a quarter of that 4%. Um, what's really critical to the success of the business is they get a, they get a lot of natural search. Mm. So they have, um, they have a very wide range. So they essentially are generating leads for the suppliers. The suppliers then, they have a drop ship fulfillment model. So the suppliers oh, okay. then deliver to the end customer. So they might be doing a, a, a route where they take in a few of the traditional building merchants, and then they also go to this private address to drop off um, what has been ordered to that address. So that's how they that's how they can afford to do the delivery of what is obviously a very challenging um, kit to deliver. Very large. So they, so they don't actually have that. their own depots. Then what you're saying the, 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 the suppliers. They, they, in the main, they don't. They actually have a depot that they keep some inventory in of stuff that sells um, very regularly. Um, but in the main, no, they, the inventory is held by um, the suppliers. Um, so the, the, the very wide range and kind of category authority means they get a lot of natural search. And so that means they can spend very little on, on sales and marketing. So they spend 4% of revenue on sales and marketing. Um, and they are profitable um, on the first um, purchase that a, that a user of the website will use. That's important because people don't perhaps redecorate their bathroom that regularly. And so you cannot, you cannot rely on a, on a repeat um, customer. They obviously mm -hmm. do get repeat customers, but it's not a traditional, it's not like buying a, a birthday card, is it? Um, so yeah, one-time sales, they, you know, very, very small. They've got 1% market share, um, but, potentially going to continue to take market share um, and again like some of the other names we've spoken about have delivered to their IPO expectations they've actually delivered what what was in expectations but they've said had they not had supply chain challenges which meant they mm. couldn't supply some product they would have been um, above that level and you think that at least some of that demand rolls into the current year. When do you think the supply chain sort of like um, issues will ease in terms of, I mean, obviously it, it seems to have eased up in certain things, but it seems to be causing other problems elsewhere. I, I think that's always going to be the nature of it. It's always going to be really hard to get ahead mm. of and work out where it's going to crop up next. Um, it, I think it's going to take some time still because you need all parts of the, of the world Chilling. functioning. Yeah. Um, uh, and you need actually quite a bit of time to get back to everything being in the right place to enable it to operate efficiently. We were just, everything was operating before on a perfectly aligned, just in time basis. Mm. Um, and I think we're still some, some way off of that. Yeah. I mean, there still seems to be sort of like, um, bottlenecks, doesn't there in chip manufacturer in certain specialist pumps and, uh, yeah. all kinds of stuff that, uh, yeah, if, if you're unfortunate, sort of like a business, which depends on the OEM who's having product shortages, then you're struggling. And now we've got it, obviously, with, you know, Ukraine and uh, and yeah. Russia with all things sort of palm oil. I mean, we've been down Tesco's trying to get some vegetable oil recently. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, now, moving on to um, some reopening plays, Revolution Bars. Again, another one I'm guessing, I'm guessing you've actually tested the product to uh, to see whether it sort of like uh, is good. But when we... I think when we chatted, the shares are roughly just over 20p. They're trading today at about 18. But again, that th once we've actually come out through the pandemic it, and, and the government has um, allowed sort of like people to go back, it sort of like serves a lot of the younger sort of like generation, et cetera. And they seem to be doing very well. They're popular. In fact, Christmas parties as well as the consumers seem to be going get great guns. 
Yeah, so um, again, I think you're, the sentiment is impacting the share price and, and the progress they've made isn't being reflected in, in, in the share price. You know, it's trading below the level that they did both of their equity raises at. Yeah. They spent the pandemic taking cost out. They spent the pandemic removing um, loss-making sites. So they went from, I think, 75 down to 67. Um, they're now recapitalized net cash, looking to invest in refurbishments and new sites. Um, we think probably recovered lever of profitability. Um, so prior to the pandemic, they did kind of six to seven and a half percent margin. Um, the management team have stated several times that they think that they can get margins up given the, the, the restructuring they've done. But even if you assume it gets to the bottom end of that prior range, you're looking at kind of 10 to 12 million of EBIT. Um, the enterprise value is currently about 40 million. Mm -hmm. So that's five or six times PE. Um, and that's for the bottom end of the prior profitability um, range. Um, so there's, there's, you know, I think there's upsides to, to that level of profitability and, and hopefully a, a re-rating as well. And, you know, you, you touched on it, but they've been dealing with wage inflation for years because national living wage has, has, been, has been going for, for some years now. Um, and, and they've managed that. Now, clearly this year is an exceptional year for, for all kinds of inflation. Um, but they have always been keen to stress that their, their clients benefit, their customers, I should say, benefit from, because their customers are typically the 18 to, to 25 year olds, where you do ask, where we are seeing quite high wage inflation. Um, so they should benefit. So there's, there's lots of things to be concerned about on UK consumer, um, but rev bars would be an example to me where there's a lot of bad news in, in the share price. Yeah, I would agree. And I think if it becomes a, if they've renovated their, their, their outlets, et cetera, then they become a destination, don't they, of choice of a lot of young people. And uh, on that basis, they, yeah. uh, they get greater productivity, I'm sure. So um, just moving to the, to the final one, which I've, I've never, well, I have looked, it was the old formerly uh, Swallowfield uh, business, I think, it's Brand Architects, which is a sort of like a, a niche <clears throat> sort of cosmetics, well, not cosmetics, but beauty products business, et cetera, skin creams, hair creams and stuff. And it's got a, um, <clears throat> it's done a sort of like, I think it's a 13.6 million pound proposed merger stock and, uh, and uh, cash with uh, Inno, Innoderma. Do you want to take us through this? Because it's run by um, Roger McDowell, isn't it? Who's the, so not run by, he's the he's, chairman. He's the chairman, yeah. Yeah, that's right. He's usually, he's usually pretty astute when it comes to sort of M&A. Yeah. yeah, so he's he's also the chairman. We've got another recovery stock, um, which is quite similar to the investment case for Reynolds that we spoke about, which is Flotech, mm -hmm. uh, which he's also chairman um, of and has invested his own cash in, as he has with, with Brand Architects. So the, the Brand Architects... But, business has um, kind of portfolio of 13 challenger brands. Mm. If you go back to around the time of the disposal of the Swallowfield manufacturing business, the, the brands element, which is now the, the ongoing business did uh, 20 million of revenue that went down to a kind of low to mid teens EBIT, uh, EBIT margin. Um, so sensible level of profitability, albeit subscale. Um, a new management team came in to kind of drive the organic and inorganic opportunity. Um, and you've just mentioned the, the, the latest inorganic opportunity, which is them buying a relatively similar business. Mm. They're paying 1.3 times EV sales um, for a business where they should be able to deliver meaningful level of synergies by taking out the PLC costs um, and, and driving potentially some revenue synergies as well. The astonishing thing about brand architects is it actually trades at a discount to the net cash on the balance sheet. Now, admittedly, that is before they've spent the money on this acquisition, but let's assume that acquisition is value accretive, which um, it, it looks sensible, it looks like it should be. Um, so they trade at a negative EV. Um, so you're not, there's, there's zero value, uh, there's negative value for the, for the operating business which okay the, the revenue has come back it was 20 i think it's come back to 16 or 17 million and the profitability has come back as well but there is an opportunity to to drive growth through this portfolio with a new management team and and the, the acquisitions should be synergistic as well and how do they compete against the big boys you know the other big sort of beauty brands whether that's png unilever with all their marketing muscle so i think that they, they would probably say they try not to compete Head right, to head. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Makes that, sense. that would be a that would be a tough game. But 
People like um, to think that they are buying differentiated brands, personalized brands, brands that, that meet particular challenges or desires that they want. Mm. Um, so people don't always want to walk into a shop and see just the big, big brands. Um, they want to see some, some kind of challenger brands as well. Um, and so you can, with a level of um, online marketing, deliver you know, good levels of growth for, for those, those kind of businesses. Mm. And so just putting all this sort of together, and we've obviously, you know, a theme through is that there's good quality businesses out there in small cap trading at very attractive valuations, which gives you a sort of like a, it gives me certainly an optimistic view going forward. What do you think will be the catalysts to lead to potential re-rating in small cap land? And uh, how long is that going to take? I, mean, I don't know, that is the $64 million yeah. question. So yeah. it's impossible to say, but uh, just to sort of like your experience, what do you think would drive a re-rating in this, in this area? So it's typically earning, positive earnings revisions. Mm. And they've, they've, them rolling, earnings revisions being, being negative um, for the last six months or so is what's driven, driven the de-rating. Um, I don't think valuation works as a as a catalyst for a re-rating. Mm. It's very supportive. It might stop things getting cheaper, um, but I don't think it it acts as the catalyst to close the gap um, in terms of smaller companies underperformance. So it's positive earnings revisions. Um, where are we on that? I don't know. They're, they're coming back at the moment. As I said, the benchmark has got 10% in for the year. Um, we've got some companies in the portfolio which have, we think have got relatively conservative expectations, mm. but there are lots of challenges for corporates at the moment. Wage inflation is coming through. You've got raw material price inflation. So, you know, we are we are still seeing earnings downgrades. Um, you know, hopefully second half of this year or, or, or early next year, that, that flips the other way and we start to get some positive earnings revisions again. The, the last point I would make actually is, you know, people are very cautious, perhaps rightly so, of the UK consumer. I think the last um, consumer survey index for the UK was minus 38. The, the, there's a 40 year track record of that data series. And the only time it's been lower than that was minus 39. Um, and that was in the in the GFC. Um, we didn't get as low as we are now in April, March, April, May 2020. So there is a lot of very negative sentiment. Um, the data so far for UK consumers actually been quite good. March data from, from Barclay Card for non-discretionary spend was up 17% versus March 2019, which is the last kind of March you can go back to, which, which wasn't impacted by the pandemic. So we know there are lots of headwinds. Um, there's a, there is a cost of living, um, um, huge cost of living headwind at the moment. Mm. Um, but on the balance sheet point that we spoke about earlier, households have relatively strong balance sheets um, and, and leverage is, is quite low. And, and a lot of these consumer stocks, and we've, we've spoken about a few of them today, um, are trading on, on um, very attractive multiples. Mm. I think also what the uh, just to add to that, what, what the market doesn't appreciate is what it can't see. And there still is an enormous quantity of private equity money looking for a home to invest. And I think one of the catalysts, certainly in a few areas, it may not drive the whole market up, but could well drive is, is just basically, you know, private equity and trade buyers gobbling up some of these stocks because, you know, you even if you pay a 30 percent premium on something extremely low, it's a great time. I mean. Uh, if you'd bought if you'd bought a shed load of small cap stocks during the great financial crisis when that uh, consumer sentiment was was just equally as bad, then you'd have made hand over fist. So uh, it was yeah. probably a good contrary uh, yeah. indicator. And that's I think you know pulling it back to the way we've structured the fund as a closed end investment trust, it gives us great comfort now because we're not having to take yes. money out of the market. We can be fully invested and and we don't know when this period of underperformance is gonna, gonna um, end. We don't know when consumer confidence is gonna improve, but it will at some stage. Mm. And we will trade out of some of these stocks and into other ones as we see fit, but we can stay invested in what we see as a, as a, you know, a, a great opportunity at the moment. Mm. And then just on that, if, if an investor wants to put some money into sort of the investment trust, is that is it best just to do it through their broker or contact? Group? Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a listed investment trust. So our MMC uh, is the ticker. Um, right. All right. Well, um, thanks very much for your time, uh, George. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, again, it gives me optimism to a certain extent because. Um, 
you know, we've just run through 15, 16 stocks there with with great op, you know, long term sort of runways and uh, very, you know, very attractive valuations, which says to me there's value around. So, yeah, I, I, if I'd, I'd encourage investors to have a look through the uh, the investment trust and um, have a look at what you've invested in. So um, thanks very much again, George. Great. Thanks very much for your time, Paul. Bye.